Welcome. Welcome to our 2018 conference. I'm Cindy Romer, um, Chair of the Board and Chair of the Conference Committee. So we hope that you're going to have a, a good conference, that it's going to be informative uh, and enjoyable. You'll make friends, and it will be a good experience for you. Um, you can't put together a conference like this without a team. There's a lot that goes into it. So I do need to take a few minutes and acknowledge a few people and address uh, a little bit of business as well as we get started. All right, and then we'll kick off into our first presentation. First of all, uh, I would like to thank our exhibitors who have come out. Some of them are still setting up, but I really want to encourage you to go back into the exhibitor room later today, tonight, tomorrow morning, and check out the resources that are there. They'll be very helpful to you. Of course, our sponsors. Our sponsors help to make this all possible. So I do want to make sure that I acknowledge them. And most of them, not all, but most of them have tables set up as well. So our bronze sponsors, Lee Silverman, uh, Voice Mobility Works, our bronze plus, Toby Dynabox, our gold sponsor, Prana Biotechnology, our platinum sponsors, Biogen and Theravance, and our super sponsor, who has been our friend for years now helping us with this conference, Lundbeck. So we have to really thank them for their commitment and support of this program to make it possible. Of course, there is our conference committee, right? So um, members of our board, and that would be Hadley Ferguson, Larry Kellerman, and Judy Biedenhorn. Of course, the entire board of directors, and I'm going to introduce them tonight. You're gonna to learn a lot about our board tonight, so I'm gonna hold off on introductions and having them stand for right now. But what I will say is that they are going to help us with a very practical need this morning. We've learned that some of the doors to the restrooms and in the restrooms are quite heavy. So if you need assistance, please do not be shy about raising your hand and asking for help, and members of our team will come around and assist you as needed. Okay. Um, also, our conference committee are our conference hosts. Phenomenal resources, enthusiastic, so helpful. Um, one partner, Dr. Mitchell uh, Miglis, he'll be here later. He's not able to be here this morning because he's doing what he does. He's helping patients. And then our first speaker of this morning, Dr. Kathleen Poston. She has been such an asset to this team in planning this conference, connecting the right people, helping to organize, and giving her time and coming out here and participating throughout these next couple of days. Uh, Dr. Poston is an associate professor of neurology and neurological sciences and by courtesy neurosurgery at Stanford University, has great experience in working with the MSA community, and she is going to give our opening speech or, or talk about Research 101. So those of you that are interested in learning more about it and what it is and what you can do, you're going to get the basics today. Now, we're not going to have Q&A for our opening session. We will throughout the program, I promise. Um, so listen carefully, take notes, and you'll have opportunities later on for questions. So if you want to, jot down some of those questions, okay? So without further ado, I am going to turn over the floor to Dr. Kathleen Poston. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, and I, I want to thank the MSA Coalition in particular. There's no way that uh, I could have uh, myself put together anything quite to this magnitude. And, and just everyone who's been on the conference calls um, and the organization committee this past year, thank you all so much. Um, this has really been a wonderful experience. So what I'm going to orient all of you to this morning is is, uh, is really trying to give you the big picture view of what I thought about when I was first approached by the MSA Coalition about possibly having this meeting in San Francisco. 
uh, this year and some of the things that I really want everyone to walk away with. I'm going to try to point out um, certain things uh, that if you want to, to hear, hear more, more about, about this, this make, make sure you make this talk, talk later, later today or tomorrow, that kind of stuff. stuff. Um, this, this is really, really supposed to be the big picture overview. I'm not going to dive into the details. details. Everything I talk about over the next 45 minutes, you will get the details of over the next two days, okay? But this is really to give you a big picture perspective, kind of an overview both of MSA and of MSA research. And again, uh, we, a lot of you thank you so much. Pre sent in questions during your registration. I will try to, I read all through those last night and organize them according to category. And um, I'll try to point out a lot of questions about this. Make sure you make this talk, that, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's start off with, oh, those are my disclosures. So the 10,000 foot view of, um, of MSA, where are, we, where are we starting from? So MSA has been a, a disorder that has really had a bit of a winding road to get to where we are right now. And I think a little bit of that historical perspective is really important in understanding the challenges that we face today. Big picture in general, there are three buckets of symptoms that people experience with MSA. Um, this early significant autonomic dysfunction um, is a big one, and we're going to be defining that term autonomic dysfunction. There will be three separate talks over the next two days on autonomic dysfunction, a, a breakout session this afternoon. Uh, there will be a talk tomorrow morning by Dr. Miglis, and then we'll have a cardiologist on the, um, on the panel, the roundtable panel discussion. So lots of conversation about what this term means, but this is really the, the um, hallmark, uh, the singular kind of connecting symptom that um, binds MSA together. And then these two motor components, this Parkinsonism, which is slowness and stiffness, and ataxia, which is discoordination. And I'm going to, again, go into a lot of detail later, sort of in a layered way, about what these things mean, and then really bring it back to the patients as far as what, how do you address this if you are experiencing this in your life. But as part of that big picture view, you have to understand how we got to this term, multiple system atrophy. Um, there are a lot of other names for MSA that you might have heard out there. Atypical Parkinsonism, atypical Parkinsonian syndrome, Parkinson's plus syndrome. Why is this? Well, it turns out well, there's a lot of overlapping features with the traditional Parkinson's disease type of symptoms. And for a very long time, people with what we now understand as MSA, we're sort of thought of as Parkinson's disease, but it's a little weird. It's a little different. It's atypical. It's, it's with additional things. And so it got lumped into this, this category when people didn't really know what to do with a patient because they weren't quite Parkinson's disease, but it had enough similarity. And then there are these other names that people use, Scheidrager syndrome. This was a medical term of people who had the autonomic dysfunction. This very long-term stridonigral degeneration that was used by a lot of physicians in the 70s and 80s. And then this even longer term, spontaneous olivoponto cerebellar atrophy. Um, that's a mouthful, OPCA, if, for those of you who like your four-letter acronyms. And that was for the people who had a lot of ataxia. And there were actually these three completely different syndromes that doctors referred to what we now call MSA. And that's because patients looked really different clinically. The people who presented with what was called the shy Drager syndrome didn't have a lot of the coordination or the balance problems, but they had a lot of the autonomic symptoms. Patients with this OPCA had a lot of the balance problems, but not necessarily a lot of the autonomic symptoms. And it wasn't until um, a very intelligent and, and, uh, and studious pathologist in the 1980s was able to look at the brains of people who had donated their brain for, uh, for research after they had died and looked at the brains of all these patients under the microscope and realized this is the same disease. This looks identical under the microscope. And when we started looking back, we realized that, this, this, that what we see under the microscope affects multiple systems in the nervous system and in the body, hence the name multiple system atrophy, combining these together. You will still see these terms. It takes decades for doctors to change their terminology. It's painful. Um, anyone who trained in medical school in the 80s or 90s, these terms were still used. Even some people in the 2000s, um, you still see these terms floating around. So you might have been diagnosed with one of these terms at some point in time. Most people now use, um, use MSA. So again, this, this, uh, this uh, pathologist in 1989 
officially changed the name. And I'm going to show you what he saw under the microscope just because um, I think it's really uh, very interesting to see. So these cells, this is a pathology slide. Um, so this is a, a slide from someone who had died and donated their brain for science. And uh, looking under the microscope, what, uh, what Dr. Pape saw was these little, the gray arrows are pointing toward these little um, black uh, blobs. And these are inside these neurons. And these neurons are the glial cells. They are the supporting cells. So you have neurons in the brain, which are the, which are the cells that fire, that, um, that actually do the work. But they need support systems, support structure. And the glial cells are that support structure. And these little inclusions, he called glial cytoplasmic inclusions, were in the glial cells. That's different than what we see in Parkinson's disease, where we see little inclusions in the nerve neurons. So that was the distinction. This is different than Parkinson's disease. It's affecting a different kind of cell. And then what it turns out is where they are in the brain is what leads to the different types of symptoms. It's all real estate in the brain, right? If you have a, just like real estate here in San Francisco, if you, you know, have one of the houses right in the marina, then you have a view of the bay. If you have uh, a house out in East Bay, you do not have a view of the bay. You have a view of a lovely golf course, perhaps. So it's all about real estate. So if you have these glial cytoplasmic inclusions in the part of the brain that affects coordination, your coordination is affected. If it's in the part of the brain that affects movement, you move slower. If it's in the part of the brain where we have autonomic function, you have autonomic dysfunction. And that's what differentiates people different ways. Now, you'll sometimes hear the term synucleinopathy. That's because in the late 1990s, people found out that these little glial cytoplasmic inclusions are clumps of a protein called alpha-synuclein. It's a protein that we all have in our brain. It's a normal protein. It does wonderful things until it changes formation and clumps together. We don't know what causes that. That's a big area of research, is what makes this happen. Alpha-synuclein is also the major protein that is changes and clumps together in Parkinson's disease. So that's why they're very similar to each other. It's the same abnormal protein. It's just that one clusters in the glial cells in multiple system atrophy, and in another, it clusters in the neurons, and that's in Parkinson's disease. So they are actually related pathologically, but they are in different parts of the brain and different types of cells. All right, that's enough science. So um, what does it mean to have multiple system atrophy? So now we characterize MSA as a characterized by autonomic nervous system. So everyone with MSA has some element of autonomic dysfunction. And again, we're going to dive deeper. What does that mean? What are the different types of autonomic dysfunction? That will come in later talks. But everyone has some element of autonomic dysfunction. And then either slowness and stiffness, which is what we term um, Parkinsonism, or coordination problems, which is what we term uh, cerebellar or ataxia. So again, you have to have the top one, and then there's some element of the bottom ones. Now, a lot of people have heard this term MSAP or MSAC. I saw a lot of questions about that and the terminology are coming in. That, only, that simply refers to the type of movement problems someone first presents with. So is the first motor symptoms that they had more of that slowness and stiffness type? Or were the first motor symptoms more the coordination and imbalance type? And if you have more the slowness and stiffness type, that's called the MSAP or MSA Parkinsonism. If it's more the ataxia or coordination, then it's the MSAC. And we designate that by the first motor symptoms people develop, even if they develop other ones later on. It's just sort of a way of us keeping track, us as physicians and scientists, keeping track of the fact that different people present differently with this disorder. Getting back to that old terminology, it's sort of a, almost a, um, you know, a, an, a, an homage to that, that old terminology where we separated these things. We actually don't know if it means anything different than just those glial cytoplasmic inclusions popped up in a different part of the brain first, whether it really has an impact on the long-term changes in the disorder or not. We're, we're, uh, there are some original studies that showed that MSAP and MSAC were a little bit different, but then more and more showing that they're actually less, they're more similar than they are different from each other in the long term. This is still an open area of debate. Again, you'll hear maybe a little bit more about those two types uh, tomorrow in the uh, movement disorders discussion um, uh, by Dr. Yang and then later on by Dr. Santini during the roundtable discussion. Let's just dive a little bit deeper into these three buckets. 
The typical autonomic symptoms are blood pressure and heart rate fluctuations, but not everybody has these to start with. People term that orthostatic hypotension. That's just a super fancy word for when you stand up, your blood pressure drops and you feel dizzy. But it turns out it's not just when the orthostatic means that it's different when you're standing, but it turns out, out in MSA it can happen at any time, not just when you stand up. Oftentimes first presents when people stand up and they feel dizzy. That can happen to all of us. If it's a hot summer day and you're dehydrated and you've been sitting you know, at a picnic for a long time and you quickly stand up, whew, get a little lightheaded, right? That can happen to anybody. It's just that with MSA that happens frequently and more and in a lot of other situations. It doesn't just have to be on a hot day where you're dehydrated and you stand up quickly. But there can be other autonomic symptoms, urinary symptoms, difficulty going to the bathroom, incontinence, urinary frequency, sleep problems, obstructive sleep apnea, this thing called REM sleep behavior disorder. You're going to hear a lot more about both of these tomorrow uh, in the sleep talk in the morning. Uh, Dr. Uh, Cow will get into details of this REM sleep behavior disorder, but this is actually one that can start years before uh, the other symptoms start and is, is an area of high research and interest because it might tell us something about the very first stages of what happens in the brain. Just very briefly, REM sleep behavior disorder is acting out your dreams. We, most of us, when we're in our deep dream phase, we don't move at all. We're actually paralyzed. And there's something that happens in the brain with people with MSA where they actually can, not everyone again, act out their dreams. This can also happen in people who have Parkinson's disease and other, um, some other types of disorders. So not specific to MSA. And then difficulty with sexual functioning. All of these are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. The Parkinsonism part, slowness of movement, again, fancy term that we use in doctor speak is bradykinesia, stiffness in the muscles, which we call rigidity, tremor, which is a kind of a rhythmic shaking, and then some slowness in walking and some balance problems. The cerebellar symptoms or the ataxia is more profound coordination. So not so much slowness as just clumsiness. This is what I teach my residents, is that if someone comes in and say, I just feel clumsy, think about ataxia. It's just, you don't have that fine-tuned coordination. Uh, you know, if you look at any two-year-old walking around, right, that they, they have ataxia, they're clumsy. Their brain isn't quite developed yet, they don't have that coordination. That sort of clumsiness we start to see sometimes with people. And that can be both with hand movements in the limb, in the trunk. It can be discoordination of the speech and swallow centers um, as well. We're going to have uh, one of our wonderful speech therapists uh, come in uh, this afternoon during one of the breakout sessions. Who, anyone who wants to learn more about sort of what we do during uh, uh, speech therapy and swallow therapy, uh, please consider attending that session. She, she's really quite wonderful um, and can explain a lot of those parts to you. Uh, she gave a talk to our movement disorders group uh, two weeks ago and I, I, it was like the best speech therapy talk I'd ever heard. I learned so much. So um, I guarantee you, you'll learn a lot too. Okay, so how common is this? It's hard to tell. Partly because it's not often diagnosed correctly. So you can see the range here, one to five per 100,000 people. That is in uh, Northern America. There is some variation across the world, okay? It's a little bit different in certain uh, societies. We don't understand why. There were a lot of questions about genetic and environmental exposures leading to the, the um, diagnosis or that could be contributing to the diagnosis of MSA. We have a great talk tomorrow afternoon, uh, the, the research clinical trials talk. One of uh, the experts in this field of genetic and environmental exposures leading to uh, MSA is going to be speaking and he sent me an email last night saying, yeah, I'd love to include that in my talk. So if you're really interested in the genetic and environment, um, uh, what we know so far, it's a huge area of research because the short answer is we don't know, um, but he can give you the latest update in what all, what that is going on. That's the clinical, is that what it's called? The I want to make sure I call these things the right thing. Because I know what we keep referring to them on the conference calls, but sometimes they got different titles. This is the clinical trials and relevant studies, um, uh, and, and as well as the research highlights and future discussions. So during that 2.15 to 3.15 talk tomorrow, we'll get into that a little bit more. Okay, so how do we diagnose this? So this is an area that I'm very interested in because I think that 
this is one of the biggest challenges we have in this field is that it takes a long time for patients to get a diagnosis. It's often a very difficult pathway to the diagnosis that leads to a lot of patient and caregiver stress um, and uh, not knowing what's going on. Um, and the problem is, is that there's no proven blood test or brain scan to say 100% this is MSA or 100% this is not MSA. They're all clues to the puzzle. Our exam, the history, how things change over time, this is what helps us the most as physicians. But we, so we do all these additional tests like the MRI scan or autonomic testing. And again, you'll hear a lot about those different kinds of tests during uh, the, the panel discussion tomorrow where we will have a cardiologist and a urologist and a GI doctor and a movement disorders doctor just will talk about sort of how we refer to one another and how those interactions work. But it is very hard. And this is, I think, what leads to a lot of the challenges is just getting to a diagnosis. There's also a lot of autonomic dysfunction in people with Parkinson's disease. So again, a lot of overlap with this cousin uh, disorder, Parkinson's disease. Same with this other disorder called dementia with Lewy bodies or Lewy body dementia. Those patients can have a lot of autonomic dysfunction. So there's a lot of overlap with other syndromes. And unfortunately, similarly with Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, we don't have a definitive test for those either. So it's not like we can say, oh, you definitely have Parkinson's, therefore it's not MSA. It's the same kind of thing that we go through. This has been a big area of research in my lab trying to come up with a better uh, brain scan that will definitively differentiate these things. But the closest we've been able to get so far is about 80% accuracy. So that's still pretty bad, quite frankly. That's one in five that we still get wrong. So that's not good enough. You know, when we want a diagnostic test, usually our goal is over 95% accuracy is considered a, a quality, a standard that can be used um, well in clinics. 98% uh, accuracy is better. Obviously, 100% accuracy is the best of the best, but that can be difficult. But um, we're nowhere close right now, so we're still working on that. But there's a lot of overlap. That's why, that's why it's hard to diagnose sometimes. So treatment. So first of all, in the big, big picture view, if we do get it wrong and we call someone with MSA, Parkinson's disease first, or we call someone with Parkinson's disease MSA first. From a treatment perspective, it actually doesn't change anything right now because we don't have a you know, cure for Parkinson's disease that doesn't work for MSA or a cure for MSA that doesn't work for Parkinson's disease. In both cases, we treat symptom by symptom by symptom. And everything you hear in the next two days that we do for people with MSA we also do for people in Parkinson's disease. But it matters from the perspective of understanding, you know, what is going on with your body and what's coming next. But from a treatment perspective, it actually doesn't make a lot of difference um, because both of them take a team. And this is really one of the take-home messages I want everyone to leave here with, to, with out of these two days. Who is on your team? Who is your team of providers? There's no one doctor who has the full skill set to take care of someone with multiple system atrophy. Um, it's just not true. You need a team of people to help with these different symptoms. So who are the types of people that you're gonna hear from over the next two days? So your movement disorder specialist, so that's me. So I did a general neurology uh, residency and then I did an extra three years um, specializing in movement disorders. Um, you need autonomic specialists, so my, my colleague and, and uh, co-host, um, Dr. Mitch Miglis, he is also an autonomic specialist, so he did again, general neurology, and then an autonomic specialty. Uh, I'm going to jump down to sleep because Dr. Miglis is also a sleep specialist. He also did a, a fellowship in sleep, as did Dr. Uh, Cow, who will be speaking tomorrow. Cardiologists are oftentimes very helpful. Um, they did internal medicine and then subspecialty training in the heart. Gastroenterology, the GI track, GI specialists. We'll have a GI specialist on the panel tomorrow to talk about all of the GI problems associated uh, with MSA that could that need to be addressed. Urology, so all those issues with urination. 
um, and sexual dysfunction come under the um, umbrella of urology. We have a wonderful urologist who's going to speak to us tomorrow. And then our additional uh, services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. And I did not include social work and other uh, ancillary services on here as well, which are just as important as all of these, the social and the emotional support for patients. So the physical support is just as important as the emotional and social support. So it takes a team. But everyone doesn't need all of these people. All of you are a little bit different. Some of you might not need anyone for sleep because your sleep is just fine. But you might need someone who's a GI specialist because constipation is a big problem. Or maybe constipation has never been an issue. You never need to see a GI doctor. Or maybe your primary care doctor is fantastic with treating constipation, so you're good there. But maybe a urologist might be beneficial. Each of you are very different. And each of your teams is going to look very different. And so what I want you all to think about as you go through here, who should be on your team who isn't on your team right now? Who do you need to go home after this meeting and maybe think about, maybe I should ask for a referral to this kind of specialist or this kind of help, okay? So I really want you to think about in terms of what you've been experiencing. You all don't need to go to all these people, but maybe you need to go to one that you haven't seen yet. What's that? Occupational therapy, thank you. Speech therapy, physical therapy, these are more common. Occupational therapy are folks who help with day-to-day uh, -day tasks. So they, physical therapists focus more on the strength and balance, whereas occupational therapists focus on things like how do I eat when um, I don't have good coordination? How do I uh, put clothes on properly when I can't tie things? Maybe I need to choose uh, different kinds of shoes to wear, things like that. So very practical applications. They can be very, very helpful. Okay, so things to think about. First of all, I really want to reiterate that every person with MSA is different. I guarantee you no two patients I've ever seen during my career are carbon copies of each other. Everybody is individual and unique and very different. And so everybody needs a different team and a different treatment plan. Um, so not everything we talk about over the next two days will necessarily happen to you. That's actually one thing I really want to take home. I don't want this to be a scare session for two hours of, oh my gosh, this is like waiting for the other shoe to drop. So that's going to happen to me too? No, not necessarily. I want people to be prepared, but not overwhelmed. And so whatever balance that is for you personally. Um, and your team, again, is going to look different than your neighbor's team. Keep that in mind. So how do you bring back what you've learned? So by the end of the meeting, I want you to write down five questions that you want to ask whoever it is that primarily takes care of your MSA. I want you to come out of here with five things that you feel like, you know what, I need to ask my doctor about that. Maybe you need to ask your doctor for a referral to physical therapy. Maybe you need to ask your doctor about some of the treatments you hear about for urinary symptoms that you just hadn't thought to tell them because you didn't realize that there might be treatments for it. Maybe you want to ask your doctor about uh, exercise programs, or maybe you want to ask your doctor, is there a social worker in our, in our area who might be available to me? You've never mentioned that before, and I heard that social workers can be very helpful. Write down five things that you want to bring back. Don't write pages and pages and pages because you'll feel overwhelmed. Really focus on the things that you feel that really resonate with you. When you hear them, you're like, wow, I, I can't believe I haven't followed up on that yet or dealt with that yet. Obviously, write them down before you see your doctor. And ask your family uh, who's here with you what questions they want you to ask as well, particularly if they're not going to be with you at the appointment. Um, I'm just going to tell you a quick funny story because this happened to me, and I realized after it happened to me that this probably happens to my patients all the time. Um, so anyone who knows me, I'm a big animal lover, and I have a sweet little cat, uh, Shaggy. She's 17 years old, and she has thyroid problems. Um, and so I brought her in to see her, her, her vet, uh, and uh, we got her thyroid checked, and she's doing okay, and I bring her home and my husband says to me did you ask about that little thing on her skin and I said no we, we talked about the thyroid problems we talked about this the thing on the skin is fine I, I looked at it and it's not a big deal and and he says to me uh, with all due respect you are a human neurologist <laughs> not a cat dermatologist <laughs> And quite frankly, you don't know anything about human dermatology either because I knew you went to one class in medical school and you don't know anything. Please ask the vet next time. Fine. It was fine. I was right. It wasn't a big deal. <laughs> but I didn't ask him, so sweetie, what do you want me to ask the vet when we to bring Shaggy in, right? 
it didn't occur to me. Of course I knew all of everything that I wanted to ask because, you know, I'm, I'm her cat mom. I knew all the questions. And he was just assuming because apparently, and I maybe just wasn't paying attention, every time he would brush her, he'd be like, you know, there's this little thing on her skin here. And that was his way of telling me he wanted me to ask the vet about it. Whereas, honey, would you mind asking the vet about this little thing on her skin when you see her next? Probably would have been a more direct route, but we all know this happens, right? And so I get this from, this happens to my patients all the time. I know they go home and they, they ask their five questions and they got home and their spouse or their daughter or their sister, you know, well, did you ask about X? Oh, no, 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 we didn't talk about that at all. Why didn't you, you've been talking about that nonstop for the past month, why didn't you talk about it? Talk to your family before you see your doctor so that you can get the most out of it. It's just human nature. This happens. It happens to all of us. Um, and it's just a, it's a good practice to get into, again, to make the most out of that time that you have with your doctor. Okay, so how do we move forward together? How do we take everything that we learn and move forward together? And this in the last uh, 15 minutes here, I'm going to talk a little bit, again, big picture about research. Because this is really our best way of getting from where we are right now to having MSA specific treatments, things that can slow progression, ultimately things that can cure. We need your help. This is not something that we as scientists can do alone. And I'm just going to give you a framework of how to think about research, because I think it's, it can be really overwhelming coming in from the outside perspective. What is it that we do? What does it mean to be involved in research? Does that mean I'm going to have to do all of these things? You know, are there different levels? What does it mean? So it's a two-way street in research. There are types of studies where we, me, researchers, learn more about MSA. So obviously, going back to that 1980s pathologist, that was really important. We needed to learn more about the disease. We needed to learn that these three things that doctors were calling different disorders were the same underlying pathology or else we couldn't move forward. So that was, that was an example of us learning more. So we call those observational research. When we ask people to come in, sometimes we draw blood, sometimes we take brain scans. We are basically gathering information so we as a scientific community can understand this disorder better. We also do it in terms of surveys. So surveys are a little bit different where we're not getting personal uh, research level information, but we're just learning general information. And so we're going to have an example of a survey here over the next two days. And it's just very simple questions about how long did it take for you to get diagnosed? How many different doctors did you see? What was your first symptom? What was your second symptom? Things like that. Because one of the things that's really important to me is not just educating people with MSA about their disorder, but educating other physicians about the disorder. How do we get primary care doctors, general neurologists, uh, uh, gerontologists, psychiatrists to recognize this disorder early? You don't come see me first. It's usually five other doctors before you get to a movement disorder specialist. How do we get them to get to the right person faster? So if you want to participate in the survey, it's just 20 quick questions. If you go to the Stanford booth, unfortunately tomorrow I'm going to have to head back to clinic this afternoon so I won't be there. But I'll be at the Stanford booth all day tomorrow. You can come by. It's 20 questions on an iPad. Or if you want to do it after you leave, I'll send out the link. It's just a, a website you can go to, and you can just click on the, again, you know, how old are you, what age were you when you were diagnosed, simple survey questions. But really important to getting that information back out there to the general medical community. This is what the experience of MSA patients is like. This is how hard it is to get the diagnosis. These are the roadblocks. How do we overcome them? Those are surveys. Observational studies you're also going to hear a lot about. One of the breakout sessions this afternoon, in fact, I forget which one it is, um, MSA cause, what can you do? Um, that, will, that will tell you a lot about, and then also the GLOMSAR, how to register and participate. Those, are, uh, those will talk to you about observational types of studies that are going on on a national and international level to try to understand what's going on with MSA. And then interventional research. So let me give a little bit better um, phrase. So I told you about the surveys. The goal there is to develop best practice guidelines so patients can get the best treatments available to them, learning different things about how patients are cared for, how they get to their diagnosis. And then research goals. Oh, sorry. I'm going to tell you why participation is important, then I'll tell you about the research goals. So why is participation important? 
Um, so these are slides that I got from uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, that they put together that um, are just as applicable to MSA as it is to Parkinson's disease. So it typically takes about a billion dollars in a decade to get a new drug to actual treatment, to FDA approval. And the clinical trials are the final step. So this is what happens, is that we do drug discovery, we figure out where in the brain the, the target is, we develop it more, we do preclinical testing, but then we have to test things in humans. Because no animal has MSA. So we have to get to the human level, and this is where no amount of funding um, can take the place of, participant, of, of patient participation in clinical trials. So these are some scary statistics here. 80% of patients say that they want to, that they're somewhat likely to participate in research, but less than 10% ever enroll in any kind of research project. And this is the one that bothers me. 85% of clinical trials face delays, and 30% never get off the ground because they don't have volunteers. Uh, so these, this is major, major barriers. So let's talk about the two types of clinical trials research. So interventional. This is where we test the impact of a drug, device, surgical procedure, lifestyle change like diet, exercise, on disease symptoms or disease progression. This is where we have you come in, we do something, and we see if it makes you better or not. Or we do something and we see what kind of side effects it cause. These have the biggest impact to help, but they also have the biggest impact to potentially cause unintended harm, because we don't know if these things work or not. That's why we're doing research on them, okay? So that's an interventional trial. This is an example. This is, uh, was published uh, a couple of years ago. Impact of resistance training on balance and functional ability um, of uh, patients with multiple system atrophy. And they looked at the, in a distance, the resistance training uh, of balance and flexibility exercises did not cause any problems and appeared to lead to improvements in balance and functional ability. So they brought patients in, they did this uh, resistance training, and they looked at the effects on balance and, and, and uh, flexibility afterwards. So this is one example of an interventional trial. They can be medications, they can be surgeries, they can be a lot of different things, but we're doing something and we're seeing whether it's safe and whether it improves things. That's an interventional trial. Observational is more, we're learning stuff. We monitor participants in their natural state over a period of time to provide researchers with data on a snapshot or natural progression of disease. Now these observational studies other than the benefit of being part of a clinical trial, we're not offering a cure. We're not offering you know, a medication. We're not offering improvement. We're learning. But we're also doing something that we know the effects of, and so the risk is much, 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 much lower. Different people like different things. Some people say it's not worth my time unless I'm going to get something out of it. I totally understand. Other people say, I don't want to be a guinea pig. I don't want to try something that's going to potentially make me worse. You can observe me all you want, but I don't want to take anything experimental. This is a personal choice. Everybody's different. But recognize the difference between these two types of trials because they do have very different guidelines. Um, and this is an example of an observational trial that I did a couple years ago. We did this brain scan, this FDG PET scan, and we showed that in people with MSA, we were able to differentiate over people with Parkinson's disease and healthy controls. But as you can see, there's quite a bit of overlap. This is that 80%. We were 80% good, um, but, uh, but there were a number of people with MSA whose scans were in the Parkinson's range, and then a couple people uh, who did not have MSA that were in the MSA range. So not quite ready for a diagnostic um, tool yet. Okay, so why don't people participate in clinical trials? For a lot of reasons. One concern is that they are worried that it's too risky and designed without the patient in mind. But there are a number of processes in place to ensure patients are considered throughout the entire process. So um, this is a long list, but just to let you know all the steps we have to go through in order to do any kind of research in humans. So it always starts with a protocol that is reviewed by a regulatory body called the Institutional Review Board. They approve every test, every assessment, every communication. So those flyers that you see, those have to be pre-approved by the IRB to make sure that they are not over, you're not promising things you can't deliver, that you're not being coercive. Everything we do communication-wise has to be approved by this board. Um, there are patients 
on these boards. Now, not patients specific to the type of disease you're dealing with, but patients and community members. So these aren't just scientists sitting around because that would be, you know, kind of a little bit missing the point. Uh, we have community members and, 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 and patients from the community on these boards. Um, a lot of the um, bigger uh, clinical trials have actual patient committees on them. Then there's the consent process. Don't ever start a study without reading the full informed consent. I know it's long, it's got a little bit of legalese in there, but it actually is there for the research participant to understand the risks of what they're getting involved with. Again, every single word on that thing is approved by the, by the IRB and is there for a reason. Informed consent is not an event, it is a process. If at any point in time you're participating in research and you feel like, you know, you told me that that MRI scan was going to be long, but now that you're explaining it to me, I'm not really sure. Could we, could we talk about that part again? Totally fine. It's a process. Just because you signed the, the form once doesn't mean you're committed no matter what, right? So you keep coming back to that. Another concern is that it'll interfere with your usual care. Okay, but participating in a clinical trial should not interfere or supersede any kind of clinical care. I always tell people to continue seeing their current medical specialist if they're participating in any type of trial, whether it's my observational trials or my interventional trials. I have a lot of research participants who come from the Kaiser system because they don't uh, do a lot of research in Kaiser, so a lot of times coming to UCSF or Stanford is a good way for them to do research. Um, but they still need to be seeing their regular doctor regularly. And in fact, the better communication I have with their regular doctor, the better, so that anything I learn, they know, and vice versa. Um, always talk to uh, the clinical trial team and I also encourage my patients to make sure or my research participants to make sure they tell their regular doctor hey I'm thinking of participating in this what do you think what are your thoughts is this a good idea for me it's always always good to do um, okay participants in an interventional trial means I have 50 percent chance of getting placebo or sugar pill so not all interventional studies have a 50% chance. It is true that we have to compare things to some sort of a placebo because it turns out simply the fact that you're in a research study, patients improve no matter what you do. Um, it's part of the process of seeing a physician more regularly or kind of maybe the excitement of being in a study. It's just this phenomenon that we see consistently and so we always have to compare it to something else. But it's not always 50%. Um, observational studies don't have any placebo. So if you don't want to have a placebo, join an observational study. It's not part of, a, not part of um, their process. Um, and then some, uh, some interventional studies have less than 50%. It, it'll be like 60, 40, or something like that. But usually an interventional study will have some form of a placebo. And if that's not something that appeals to you, consider an observational study instead. So just to summarize here at the end, um, I really want the next couple of days to be an opportunity for you to reflect on your experience with MSA. And maybe there are things that we talk about here that haven't crossed your mind before and you're, it kind of resonates with you. Hey, this is, gosh, that really sounds like something I've experienced that I've never thought about. Write it down, okay? And make sure you talk to your doctor when you get back, all right? Or if you, if you weren't aware that there's a specialist that we have here uh, that you realize, well, maybe I need to see that specialist, write it down and ask for a referral next time you, you, uh, see, you see your doctor. Um, a lot of the specialists that I'm going to have in the panels here today, the gastroenterologists, the urologists, cardiologists, these are very common out in the community. You don't have to go to a highly specialized place like Stanford or, or UCSF to get those kinds of doctors. They're out there in the community. Probably of all the physicians that are up here talking over the next two, day, uh, two days, uh, probably the autonomic specialists are the ones that are the most highly concentrated in one place because they have to have this very specialized equipment. And I believe our autonomic lab is the only one on the West Coast. Uh, if I remember uh, the last time I was, I was told I had a patient from somewhere else, I was trying to find one closer and we were the closest one. But other than that, the other specialists should be in your local communities. Physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy are definitely more local in local communities, and I bet there are social workers as well. So think about who else needs to be on your team and who else you need to think about getting a referral to. 
And then definitely consider participation in uh, surveys or research. Again, I'll be at the Stanford booth all day tomorrow. You can pop by and do our quick little survey. After you leave, if you just want to do it in the, in the uh, confines of, of your own home, again, it's just 20 questions. I'll send out the link so everyone can get on there and, and do it. Um, you can have a family member do it on your behalf. I think one of the first questions is who's filling out this form, the patient with MSA or a caregiver on their behalf, just so I know who it is that's filling out the form. Um, but definitely consider. And then consider some of the other observational trials and some of the other things you're going to hear about tomorrow. Again, a lot tomorrow afternoon on clinical trials. But you'll hear a little bit this afternoon on the Glomsar uh, breakout session to hear about that particular study as well. Um, so with that, I just again want to thank the MSA Coalition for everything that they've done in putting these next two days together. I hope that this is really an informative time for all of you and this is a time that you can all um, walk away knowing more about MSA in a way that is beneficial to your own health and your own well-being. Because I really feel like people uh, who know more about what's going on with their bodies um, will, uh, will take care of their bodies the best. Um, and with that, this is the Stanford Movement Disorders team. Every time I give a talk, I have to update the slide. Um, this is our newest member, uh, Dr. Blewett, who is joining next week. Um, and uh, I just, again, want to thank you all for participating and being here today. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Post, and we really appreciate your participation today. One point of clarification, this survey, since the link is going yep. out to anyone interested so yep. people could take online from our community beyond who's here today. So this correct. is anyone. But this is strictly for current patients. Could you clarify just who oh, the audience is? Yeah, that's a great question. It can be current patients or past patients. Again, it's, it, the focus is about, um, is, is, you know, how long did it take to get the diagnosis? How many doctors did you see before you got the diagnosis? What other diagnoses did you get? There are some questions on what are your current symptoms that are most bothersome, but you can just skip those um, if it's, if it's a, a patient who has, who has passed away. So yeah, yeah, because it's still helpful to me to know how long it took someone to get diagnosed even if, uh, even if, they've, if, even if they're, they've already passed away. So yeah, anyone can take it. I, I will take any information. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Poston. So as you heard, we've got a good deal of uh, information in this year's program about research. So that's a big focus this year. Uh, another big focus this year is the patient, because you are at the heart of what we do, what the doctors do, and we're here to try to help you. So uh, I acknowledged our conference committee earlier, but I want to make a point of thanking two nonprofits who have been working with us as well. Um, the first I'll, I'll mention is MSA New Jersey and my sister Kim Romer, who is the, the chair there, who had some ideas for a great patient segment for their New Jersey conference and shared that with us and actually contributed and worked with the committee to try to bring it to this conference for you. So thank you, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> There's our New Jersey oh, and a link. And the second is the Brain Support Network, uh, Robin Riddle and her team, who have been helping coordinate. They're right out here in the Bay Area, so they have been helping out here, and they're also participating in our conference. So we very much appreciate Robin and Candy and Stephen and her team. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. We have to thank all of our partners. As you've been hearing already all morning, we're a team, right? We have to work as a team. So, Okay. So moving on. The next uh, part of our program is a support group segment. And we've actually moved this to earlier in the program. And we'll have another one at the end because we try to listen to your feedback. And we've learned that people really want to get to know each other early know who their fellow patients are, maybe who's in their region, share their ideas, their resources. So our next phase, we're going to stay in this room, but we're going to separate. And we're going to ask that the patients be on the right, 
and the care partners be on the left. So you'll be near your, your friend, family, loved one, but we're going to separate you out so that you can be in two groups and talk about what's going on, what your questions are, get to know each other, get some resources. And you're in very good hands because I just mentioned our charity partners, and I, I ended with Brain Network, Support Network because they are going to help facilitate this session. So for the patients, we have Robin Riddle, the CEO of the Brain Support Network and co-founder. And for the care partners, we have their MSA group leader, Candy Welch. So they will be facilitating these sessions. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to split up, and then I'm going to turn it over to the facilitators to uh, go ahead and lead their groups. Afterwards, we'll explain where you're going next. There is going to be a room change, and we'll get into all those details. Okay.